Ja, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I'm on the air. Um, I'm pleased that I may um, welcome you to this roundtable, the final round um, on this uh, two days conference. Um, and we have heard many instructive ideas and uh, topics, and uh, I think we can uh, get some contributions now um, in this final round. Um, I don't think I have to um, portray the people. Um, you have this little booklet, and um, some of them you have already heard yesterday or today. Um, I've asked, uh, or I'd like everybody um, to ask to uh, start with a short statement, maybe five minutes, um, to tell us which he or she uh, finds uh, especially uh, important in, about this wide topic, this wide field we have got for the final round. And then uh, we can start a real discussion and um, we'd like also to let you participate. Um, but now I'd like to begin with Professor Kirchhoff. Um, what, what do you find um, most important? Um, what would you like to contribute? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to say some words about communicating justice. I thought about it what I would say. Uh, let me tell about some personal experiences. When I came into office in 2010 as a vice president, I had the opinion if the procedure is finished, the judgment is pronounced, the work is done, and the after work party begins. It was wrong. I was totally wrong. Because there are so many opportunities of misinterpretation, sometimes by purpose, sometimes by laymen who don't know what they have done. And there are so many opportunities to use the written judgment for his own purposes. And I learned we must guide the interpretation afterwards, after pronouncing the judgment. Uh, if we would not do it, we would lose let's say, the sovereignty about our judgment. And in the end, we would not understand in the public and we would lose the general acceptance that the constitutional courts urgently needs. And then we, that means President Voskuhle and me, we decided to work hard not after work party, but on guiding our uh, judgment afterwards. And that means explaining what we thought, what we have done. That uh, means defending, not as a sinner or as an accused person, but defending uh, the judgment, its reasons why we had its reasons in this way or in this way. And we started this work. The address was uh, the public and the media too, especially the media as a transmission uh, means uh, for the public opinion. In addressing uh, the public, that's no problem, giving interviews, uh, having speeches, writing articles, but the media is a difficult, delicate point. We have in Karlsruhe a press conference with some 40 members, all being jurists. There the job is done without uh, many problems. The problems are the laymen of the journalists. The journalist who in the morning writes an article about the municipality and its streets, in the afternoon, in the afternoon an article about the local football club, and in the evening about the decisions of the court. That's a real problem. And there we are very keen on working, explaining, and so on. Working with the media is a delicate point because uh, the media has other interests than the judge. I learned first rule, never try to be the body of the journalists. Don't embrace them. They have other interests. 
say uh, like the event, say like the Big Bang, they are interested in human relations between the judges. How has Mr. Milley, Judge Miller done this? How has Judge Smith done this? And so on. In spite of us uh, being very cautious, saying not so much in a judgment, and developing <laughs> the jurisprudence step by step. And therefore, we uh, try to have good contacts with the media, but not so near, not so near a vicinity, uh, always keeping distance, but speaking trustful with each other. That means in the uh, end, for example, never go in a talk, talk show. That means entertainment, and uh, the item is by accident, court and justice and decisions, but they are not interested in earnest deliberations, in uh, scientific discussions and so on. That's a line we try to, fall, to follow. I can't say if we are successful in it, but we try very hard and we are quite sure if we don't try it, we will lose the acceptance, the general acceptance in the public which we need and we lose the opportunity to explain what we do, that the judges are for the people and not for the state or for some other hidden purpose. And we explain, we have the chance to explain our procedures, our mentalities, how we come to a decision. I think it has paid in the last 10 years, but maybe that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kirchhoff, for the insight. Thanks for the insight in the thinking of the judges um, of the Constitutional Court of Germany. Uh, yesterday, Professor Paulus also has told us a little bit about it. Um, of course, I'd like to discuss uh, this topic personally, but uh, as a moderator, I have to hold back. And later, Joshua Rosenberg, as a member of the endangered species, as we yesterday have learned, um, will maybe say something about this topic uh, from the view of the journalists. But now, uh, Professor Gen, um, what do you think about this I wide think? field of topics? <laughs> what, what do you find most interesting, important? Okay, so um, I'm not sure if I've done what I was asked to do, uh, but I, I, I very rarely do what I'm asked to do, but I thought I would structure my comments. First of all, what I wanted to do was to pick out some of the points from the conference that have struck me very forcefully. Uh, I should say again, I think it's been, it's been an absolutely fantastic conference, so stimulating, and I thought I had thought about these topics, and actually I realised that I'd hardly thought about some of them at all, uh, and so I'm going to do a lot of more thinking uh, later on. So some of the points that I picked up from the various presentations in the conference, which I, I think are going to need more discussion, uh, are first of all, the point that transparency, that there's a lot of focus on transparency in relation to hearing. So a lot of focus on the hearing. And yet we heard quite a lot about the need for transparency in all parts of the justice system. If we believe that transparency is at least one of the essential elements um, in promoting uh, the legitimacy of the justice system and public confidence, then we need to have transparency in all aspects of the justice system. We heard a bit about um, the appointment of judges, but there are many any other processes that go on prior to people coming to court uh, that could do with uh, some greater, um, greater thought and, and more transparency. Uh, the other point that hit me is that transparency is not an end in itself, and I think that has to be reinforced. Um, what, what transparency is there, I think, to demonstrate that we are protecting, or we, it shows how the fundamental values of a justice system are being uh, protected. And when we think about the fundamental principles or fundamental values of a justice system, it's about things like equality, it's about things like procedural fairness, and ultimately it's about substantive outcome. So this focus not just on the transparency of the process, but transparency of process that leads to procedural fairness and just, just substantively just outcomes. And quite often we don't talk enough about just outcomes. Um, 
I was struck very much by uh, one of the uh, one of the key points from Judith's um, presentation, uh, uh, and this is a theme that runs through everything: is that the public is an essential part of the justice system, not just in terms of having access to the justice system, but observing it and keeping it under observation. And I think that we forget that. And I'm going to come on if I have time very quickly to say what my worries are about the UK con uh, context. Uh, the other point that was made in many of the other presentations, many of the presentations, is that in the end, what we're going to be looking for all the time is a balance between transparency and also the need for privacy. So Judith highlighted the contaminating effects of too much publicity, of fake publicity, of distorted publicity. Uh, and we have to be careful that we don't, that, that we don't run that risk. But on the other hand, uh, we need to uh, promote publicity and transparency wherever we can. Now, just picking these things up and reflecting on the context of the beleaguered United Kingdom, or I feel it's beleaguered at the moment, um, that we are, as Lord Justice Ryder said yesterday, that we are in the process of embarking on some of the most far-reaching reforms to our justice system that we have ever had. And can I be clear, this is not a local issue. This is a global trend. Uh, and I think I made that point quite forcefully yesterday, that, you know, we are already there. The digitization of courts, the disappearance of public hearings, and indeed in our jurisdiction, the disappearance of courts. Our courts are being sold off. Um, it isn't fanciful to think that they've all become bars and discos or whatever. They are being sold off. We are losing the public buildings. We're losing the buildings that created that shadow. And uh, there is, and I have a real anxiety about the extent to which this moving away from physical congregation from courts as a place to the concept of court as a service, I worry about what the longer term, effect, longer term social effects of that will be. I see that there are arguments that you can, with digitization, you can have greater accessibility. That if things are online, if people can, um, it can initiate proceedings using their iPhone, that oh, on the one hand, that creates an opportunity for greater access. But at the same time, and this, these are the sort of battles that I'm kind of fighting at the moment, that we have major questions about whether that will increase access for all of those people who would want to have access to the courts. Um, will those kinds of digitized processes better meet the needs of litigants? Can digitized processes away from public hearings, away from formal gaze, away from um, even the publicization of what's going on uh, or of the judgments, can those processes, will those processes deliver procedurally fair and substantively just outcomes? It's not a question of does the technology work, it's what does the technology do? What is, was it, is, what is it there for? What is it replacing? Um, and um, I think that there is, uh, I think there are real implications of uh, the lack of public access to what's going on in, um, in on online uh, proceedings. Um, I think that there may be long-term consequences. I don't know what there will be. And the last point that I'll make before I shut up is that what we don't have, there's been a huge amount of talk about Legitima legitimacy of justice systems, of public confidence, of public trust, we actually know remarkably little about what contributes to public, uh, a public sense of trust and confidence. We know that greater transparency is probably a good thing, but what other things do people want to know? They don't want to know just what the process is. They want to know what does the process deliver and do I, as a litigant, perceive that this process has dealt with me fairly? And in particular, the person who is the losing party in uh, an action, does the losing party feel that that outcome is acceptable because they have been through a fair process. So those are some of my concerns, and I'll stop now. Okay, thank you very much. In, indeed, a bit... <laughs> indeed, it has some uh, worrying side effects, what uh, you have described and what may uh, come to us in Germany and France and so on, <laughs> what you already uh, can watch in the UK. Um, Professor um, Clement, you have yesterday had the chair uh, on the topic of public hearing and uh, or the right to public hearing and access uh, in criminal proceedings. Um, 
as we now have heard, uh, maybe uh, this will take place uh, soon, uh, not in the court building, but in the disco. <laughs> nice <laughs> idea. <online>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or online, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. What Joachim. do you think? Yeah. Um, okay, if I may summarize uh, the outcome of the conference, I must say uh, we are uh, in principle all in uh, favor of transparency or open justice, and nobody is against it. Um, uh, but, okay, <laughs> that's, that's good for the discussion. Um, uh, but, but we have, um, as legal scholars, uh, carefully to distinguish by what we mean by saying open justice or transparency. And then it becomes, in my eyes, controversial. Um, open justice is um, a widespread, a colorful term, and that is why we chose it as uh, the title of the conference, and uh, this is also why so many of you uh, participated. Um, open justice is, as um, Justice Ryder pointed out yesterday in his speech, um, not only the principle of publicity of legal uh, proceedings. And uh, if I see right, I can, uh, from the conference, mm, identify the following five topics. Uh, first, the public character of nomination of judges. That was um, the panel with uh, my colleague, Professor Gigerich. Uh, second, the right to equal access to court and to an effective remedy. Third, the establishment of negotiated justice as the answer to, as Professor Ligeti said and remarked, a shift of society towards more egalité and the loss of coherence. Fourth, public character of legal proceedings and it is this what I think we can call the publicity principle. And fifth, right to contribute to legal reasoning as, legal, as a legal scholar, which um, calls for accessible written judgments. As far as the fourth and the fifth topic are concerned, public character of legal proceedings, right to contribute to legal reasoning, I think um, open justice follows from the character of the law itself. Um, in the 19th century, the creation of publicity was an instrument to release the judiciary from the absolute power of uh, the monarchy. And today, to me, it seems clear that the law can only be king or queen if it is clearly comprehensible and for, for everyone, and that if people can understand how it is derived from the written texts. Law must be in every respect accessible. Thus, our whole constitutional thinking is based on the idea that the lawmaking process must in principle be public, and it, it doesn't depend on if it is written in an Article 47 of the Charter or in uh, Article 6 of the Convention. Um, this might appear obvious, but I think it's, it's um, an important point to note as uh, during the conference we have been focusing a lot on the good impacts of open proceedings. We said that um, publicity would help to control the lawmaking process administered by the courts and it would provide for, for fair and, and good decisions. Uh, the publicity of criminal proceedings uh, would ensure the observance of the principle of individual guilt, as said the Bundesverfassungsgericht. Uh, the publicity of administrative process would support the achievement of public interests. And, and all these are perfectly valid observations. Of course, we can rationalize publicity with good impacts. But I would make an important addition. We should not forget that publicity of lawmaking, in, from my point of view, is an end in itself. It follows from human dignity that everybody should be entitled to participate in the democratic polity. This includes the right not only to elect the parliament and follow the parliamentary debate, but also to attend and understand the functioning of all lawmaking entities, including the courts. The court is a lawmaking entity. Um, this right to participate may be used individually for any kind of freely chosen purpose. 
Hence, the courts are not only open for law students or legal scholars, but for everyone. It is not the publicity of justice, that, but its limitation that has to be justified. In an open society, all law has to be uh, public law to some extent. And I think indeed um, that the right to participate covers the right to report the contents of uh, legal proceedings to other people as well. Uh, may it be oral, in papers, or in social media. It is the social discourse in which men become uh, what they are. Uh, we can't directly ex exclude media public from the public principle. At the same time, of course, I must admit that the public principle cannot be applied without exception or qualification. For instance, there certainly are proceedings in which justice can only be done if it is not in public. Um, this not only applies to criminal proceedings, but to uh, civil and administrative proceedings as well. There may be good reasons to uh, exclude uh, the public uh, from uh, certain matters, and it might also be reasonable uh, to decide uh, about that exclusion not on a case-by-case -case basis, but in a general and abstract manner. Searching for ultimate justice in each individual case may create injustice. Thus, we should not criticize the German Constitutional Court for leaving decision-making autonomy to the lawmaker how much court publicity he allows for. Uh, the court accepted the exclusion of media public in the existing um, uh, section 169 of the German uh, Court Constitutional Act, Gerichtsverfassungsgesetz, um, and it will also, this is my, at least my prediction, accept the new section 169 that provides a complex system of exceptions and counter exceptions. We might question the political wisdom of the new rules that are difficult to apply and will cause, uh, no doubt, new legal disputes. We may wish that the legislator would have been less fearful against the media. He could have, for example, allowed uh, the transmission of film recordings uh, and not only of sound recording to a separate courtroom for media representatives but uh, the judicial yardstick should be the constitution and not our political wish. And so far, judicial self-restraint, if I may use this uh, Anglo-Saxon term, uh, is the right way. The publicity of legal proceedings must be subject to a continuous public discourse. We should not petrify our current position on this question in the constitution or in the Human Rights Convention. The best place to negotiate about the public principle is the parliament. So this is my point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Clement. You have succeeded in uh, summarizing everything we have discussed in the whole two days um, in one statement. And you also took a view or looked into the glass uh, ball and uh, could prognosticize um, what will come from Karlsruhe uh, as a next judgment. Um, maybe we'll hear a bit about that later. Um, but uh, I've got a good chance now to pass um, the uh, floor to um, Advocate General Bobek because he already um, has announced um, his contradiction by raising his hand. And so I'm curious what you are going <coughs> to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good, good afternoon. I'm very sorry to disappoint, as per usual. Uh, partially, uh, the job of an advocate general is to disagree, which is my privilege and pleasure to do quite often. Well, um, five minutes and a closing statement on the very rich discussion, which I had the privilege to take part this morning in. I mean, the advantage of being at the end is essentially that one can disguise the lack of ideas for lack of time. However, communicating justice, why I raise the hand in provocation to otherwise marvelous statements. Well, if we put it like that, are you in favor of more openness and transparency? Everybody will say yes. 
It's a similar question as, do you want to be nice? Well, yes. But that's where the problem starts. We haven't answered anything at this moment, okay? And the discussions, as, it is the, as, as they unfolded today, are precisely witness to that problem. Because transparency, what is it? We are already, and it has been already mentioned sometimes, essentially, is transparency or judicial openness a intrinsic value, or is it instrumental? If you are the hardcore transparentist, and you will tell to me, for me, it's intrinsic. It's a goal in itself. I don't need any further justification and no limitation, okay? Everything should be accessible. But it's actually a very bad idea, really, okay? And if we agree transparency and openness and instrumental value a means to an end, then we are having a problem. And the problem is arising, and one of follows the discussion and talks about greater transparency in court, it's precisely this vagueness in terms of what do we want it for, okay? And that's a classical, classical bit of, of course, yet again, we have reopened these discussions recently simply because of the evolution in technology, okay? Because a number of things which are previously impossible are now possible. But then yet again, is the answer to, do we want more openness? Do we want public hearings online, podcasts, web streaming, access to the entire file online? We can do all of that technically. Is it a good idea? And my clear answer is no, it's not a good idea. And it's because for me, at least in the judicial forum, the uh, transparency and openness is simply a means to an end. And in order to usefully engage in a dialogue how to do it, I need the aim. I need the end destination. What do we want to do with that? Is it control? Is it education? Is it deductive purposes? Is it generating legitimacy? And in what specific area? Appointments, public hearings, access to, access to court documents, and so forth. And this matrix creates different answers, creates different means, creates different solutions. I actually liked very much in the morning in the contribution of of Professor, Professor Gigerich, I don't know, there was this one of the beautiful slides in which he said, well, look, on the one hand side, in terms of, um, of transparency, the appointment procedure to the Bundesverwaltungsgericht is not ideal, but it's, it's considered highly legitimate. Oh, okay. So this all falls to pieces? Because if I increase transparency, I don't generate greater legitimacy and vice versa. So there is a number of things at, 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 at play. I mean, coming back to the example from the morning, and I, I, shall, I shall allow myself to do it because I, we have been with friends with Alberto for quite some time, so I shall use his beautiful metaphor about light in the kitchen, okay? It's beautiful, demagogic, sorry. From the point of view is, what is light, okay? And unless you insert to me why should there be light in the kitchen? Of course, everybody will say, we want to have light in the kitchen. But the question is, if you come to a restaurant, do you want to go to the kitchen? <laughs> I don't. I mean, why do you go to a restaurant? Because I know what it is, somebody recommended it to me, or because I'm just desperate and hungry. In neither of the three scenarios, my first thought isn't, I want to see the kitchen, okay? <laughs> So from this point of view, the strength of the argument and the beauty of the argument is in the choice of the metaphor. And I'm not entirely sure a metaphor here is actually doing the best service for what he wanted to say. So from this point of view, my simple and only point for the, the, the five minutes I was allocated is pretty much I am very happy to engage, and I have engaged in judicial capacity and previously academic capacity in the discussion about openness and transparency, but we need to be precise. What, why, and what for? Because the idea that it's a mechanical implication, greater transparency is inducive to greater legitimacy, simply doesn't work, okay? And I'm very sorry if somebody already mentioned that metaphor yesterday, I wasn't here yesterday, but you all do know the old Bismarckian quote, which actually is not from Bismarck, which says, you shouldn't know how laws and sausages are made. Thank you. Thank you very much for expressing uh, such strong opinions. And 
I'm quite sure nobody is appointed about what you have said. And uh, I find it fascinating what a career this metaphor of the kitchen of uh, Professor Alemano has made during the day. Uh, maybe it will be topped again. <laughs> but now, uh, Joshua Rosenberg, you are the man from the media. Um, do you want to be the buddy of Professor Kirchhoff, which he uh, no. doesn't want to be for you? <laughs> no, I think he's wrong, unfortunately. Um, um, I'm very surprised at the idea that uh, uh, a, a judge like you would talk about one of your own judgments to a journalist, because where I come from, uh, a journalist, I ask uh, questions of the Lord Chief Justice, I've done interviews with uh, senior judges, he has a press conference once a year, but the one thing that we would not do ever in our system is ask a judge about his or her decision. We would never expect a judge to explain his or her decision. And there's a very good reason for this, because once a judge talks extrajudicially outside the court about the decision, then the judge is modifying the decision, is adding to the decision, is changing the decision. And if that decision is a precedent, it's going to be cited in subsequent cases, then a lawyer will cite not only what the judge has said in court, but what the judge has said outside court. So it's absolutely wrong for a judge to speak about his or her decided case. Judgments must speak for themselves. Um, I asked to speak last so that I could comment on all the previous speakers. Um, Hazel Gen, a very good friend of mine, is concerned about online courts. And I went to see an online court in Canada, uh, in British Columbia, on the Pacific coast. Uh, it's uh, called uh, the Civil Resolution Tribunal. But it's a very strange idea to go and see an online court because, of course, there's nothing to see. Um, it exists only online. I talked to the judge who was running the court. I talked to one of the officials of the Ministry of Justice who was helping to design the court. But as a member of the public, you will never find the court. It doesn't have a building. It has a post office address, which is a post office box number, which is difficult to find. But of course, you find it online. And at the moment, it deals with small claims. It deals with disputes between neighbors. And it seems to be working quite well. Um, it's private until it delivers its judgments. And all the judgments are available online. Um, I don't think people quite realize that the judgments are public and online. But because it's a way of resolving disputes rather than adjudicating disputes, a very small proportion actually get to the decision-making stage. Now, Professor Clement talked about public proceedings. Um, and um, uh, then, of course, uh, Advocate General Bobek was also talking um, about uh, the degree to which proceedings can be made public. And uh, this is something that concerns me a great deal. Um, I'm a journalist. I deal with individual cases. And we have two or three individual cases uh, in England and Wales, which are very current at the moment. And I think it's much easier to actually describe real cases in order to uh, derive the principles that uh, we can consider. That's how we do things in the common law tradition. Uh, we have a body called the Parole Board. The Parole Board decides whether it's safe to let a prisoner out if that prisoner has been sentenced to an indefinite sentence, an indeterminate sentence. We have a particular prisoner named Warboys. He has served the minimum term that he was set by the court. The minimum term was eight years. He has served 10 years in prison and uh, the question is whether he should be released. The parole board has decided that he is safe to be released. He's no longer a danger to the public. Um, there is a provision in legislation which says that we, the press and public, cannot find out why the parole board has said that he is safe to be released. That is being challenged in the courts in London next week. The argument is that the minister who made secondary delegated legislation 
which says that the proceedings are private, that minister had no power to make those regulations. They are, uh, if we can still use the Latin phrase, which we're not meant to in England, they are ultra vires. They are beyond the powers of the minister to make. So it's a very interesting question for the court to consider next week whether a blanket ban on access to a body which is taking the position of a court can be justified. Now, in one sense, it's a court because it decides whether somebody can stay in prison or not. In another sense, it's not a court because it's simply deciding whether somebody is safe to be released. So it's an interesting question for the English courts. Uh, another issue on which I'm extremely concerned is how we in England and Wales deal with complaints against judges. Uh, we had a judge in England who was a really bad judge. He was a very nice man, but the main problem with him is he had absolutely no judgment at all. I wrote about him 10 years ago, and I called on him to resign, and I have been calling on him to resign ever since. He's a man called Peter Smith. He resigned a few months ago, uh, 10 years after I first complained. He resigned um, two days before a hearing was due to take place to consider whether he was guilty of misconduct. Who were the judges who were taking part in that hearing? We were not told. What were the allegations of misconduct against him? We were not told. Where was the tribunal going to sit? We were not told. What would the decision be and what would the reasons be? We would not have been told. This entire process was going to be decided behind closed doors and I as a journalist thought that was wrong. Now, Advocate General Bobek says, but what is the reason why you should know this information? Um, if I can put an idea in his mind, he might say to me, this is confidential. This is about the behavior of a judge. This is about the competence of a judge, or at least the conduct of a judge. Um, surely this is confidential. No, I would say it's not. A judge is a public figure. A judge must be answerable to the public. What is the purpose of publicity? It is to make sure that public figures do their job properly. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, interesting examples uh, which make it possible to uh, get the real problem. And uh, for me as a German law reporter, it's really astonishing how many secrets uh, the British courts have. And um, I also found it very astonishing, um, uh, you, you, were, you have been astonished about Professor Kirchhoff and that he talks about his uh, judgments. Um, what Professor Kirchhoff did not say, um, it's not very seldom in Germany that um, judges talk to some reporters even before they declare the judgment. Um, so that when it's uh, in the public, the journalist really knows what's behind. So, Professor Kirchhoff, I think you might like to say something. Yes, it's in common use talking to journalists for justices too in Germany. Therefore, it's nothing new. But uh, you must see uh, the people wants to understand it's the court system. They want to understand what we have said and if we let interpret the uh, judgments only by other lawyers and jurists, there will be a misinterpretation. Therefore, we have to guide this interpretation. And let's make an example. Look at the events in Poland, in Russia, and Turkey. We have a, a very strong line of jurisprudence that uh, court must be independent, how the judges must be elected, and so on. And now we have these events, and people are asking us, journalists are asking us, what do you think about it? And I'm not the one to, say, uh, to deny any uh, saying about it. And then I have to declare what we, what our line of jurisprudence is. And why I think uh, in uh, Poland or in Russia and Turkey, it's not going the correct way. I am forced to explain my judgments and the jurisprudence of the Federal Constitutional Court. 
and therefore we try to do it at the first step and not only in the second or third step if another person has misinterpreted our uh, judgments. That's the situation we are in. And then some cases are very complex. Look at the judgment about the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, there are many pages of this judgment, I see, <laughs> but it's not enough to be understood by laymen, and therefore we have to explain. We have not to defend, we have not to give a new reasoning, but we have to explain what we thought about it during our libera deliberations. And that's an important part of the, of the presiding judges in the Federal Constitution Court. It has become an important part. Yeah. Uh, I've seen both of you, but uh, I'd like to stick to Professor Gen uh, first because I'd like uh, the British view uh, in uh, in exchange. Um, uh, are German uh, judges too talkative? Well, uh, I think English judges can be quite talkative and uh, they make an awful lot of speeches and they make many more speeches than they used to. And sometimes judges will make public speeches about things that people might think are slightly controversial. But I think the real difference in listening to you and uh, Joshua's comments, the real difference is speaking about, about a particular case that you have just decided. And our view is your reasoning should be in the decision and preferably people should be able to understand it by reading it. If they can't understand it by reading it, then you should, ha as our UK Supreme Court has, we have a press office, you can actually explain it in layman's terms. But your reasoning should be there in the decision and there shouldn't be more that you need to say and that you shouldn't be speaking, as Joshua said, about that particular case. That doesn't stop judges from giving speeches about general issues, about talking in general, about things that are sometimes quite topical and a little bit controversial. And sometimes some judges Judges have been criticised for being for straying too close to areas that are politically controversial. So they have to be quite careful. They tread uh, a careful line. Those judge uh, those speeches are um, put on the judicial website, so they're available. The, the second that people give the speech, it's up on the website. The speech that Lord Justice Ryder gave yesterday will be up on the judicial website today. Everybody can read it, and I think that's very good. So you actually have a very good sense of what judges think in general about certain topics. What you don't have is a judge elaborating on what he just said in court. And while I've got the floor, can I just have to make a comment about the, the metaphor on, on kitchens uh, and answer to you, can I just say <laughs> that contrary to you, if I had a choice between two restaurants, one where I can see the kitchen where people are co cooking in the open and one where they're inside, I'll go to the one where they're cooking in the open because actually I like to see where my food is being prepared. So I just had to say that. Great. Uh, Professor Clement and then Professor Bobek, please. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to say that I think that um, the sensitiveness uh, on the British side against that German practice uh, um, to speak with journalists about uh, specific cases might have something to do with the difference between uh, case law and continental law, just a little bit at least, um, because uh, the German, the continental approach would not be that we develop the next de decision from the earlier decision. Uh, but I must also admit that uh, at least at the constitutional level with the Bundesverfassungsgericht, uh, we're not too far away from a case law system. Um, so uh, maybe we can learn a little bit of your uh, criticism as well here. Thank you. Kitchen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my quick answer, one sentence. Those kitchen, uh, hashtag uh, shop window because yes you are consequential transparentist congratulations but then how will the kitchen work internally will they really do all the activities they would normally do in a kitchen if they know they are being watched by the customers my answer to this is absolutely not okay and half of the stuff will come from the freezer and the real stuff will be done somewhere where you don't see you just pushed the activity back into obscurity. But what I wanted to say really was the reaction to, to what was mentioned by, by, by Joshua Rosenberg. I mean, thank you very much indeed for the example, which under my civilian heading would be disciplinary proceedings against judges, because then I can elaborate what I meant there. Okay, aim of a disciplinary proceedings against judges 
control, public control, the element is much stronger than anything else. So from this point of view, means to be achieved that, of course there must be public hearing, there will be by default public hearing, the composition of the bench must be known, and anybody who can wants to come can sit in and listen to the hearing, unless of course there are any of the reasons for exclusion of the public, which must be enumeratively named and reasoned. However, why I was mentioning this and being of course a bit provocative, is we are no longer talking about this, or at least not in my part of Europe. It's rather the question of, oh, and shouldn't we also sort of web stream it live in order to have a public reality show of, 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 of sort of piching the judge in the public? And what about accessibility of the full pleadings and the full uh, piece of accusation? Shouldn't it be there in the public, anonymized, non-anonymized? So this is the type of problems I was talking about in terms of is transparently un unreserved good in itself. But thank you for giving me the example of clarifying. Of course, there's absolutely no question that the hearing and all the elements of it must be public in the name of public control. But there we are absolutely clear why and what we know to achieve. And I shall make no comment on the English situation. Uh, shall I pick up this point about web streaming? Um, and, and, and just to also, um, uh, pick up a point that uh, uh, was made by Judge Kirchhoff. I mean, years and years ago, I spoke to a very senior judge in what was then our final court of appeal, which was the House of Lords. And he told me, we're giving judgment this afternoon. And he said, you might find it quite difficult to work out what's happened, because uh, when you get a raw judgment from a court, it's not like a law report. It doesn't tell you the result, at least it didn't in those days. And he said, there were five judges on the court, he said, two of us have come down on one side, two of us have come down on the other side, and there's one in the middle who agrees with both sides. And, and he said, you might find it quite difficult to work out what the result of the case is, and in fact, so that you know what to expect, this is what we have decided. And indeed, um, in those days, and even now, we, the press, are given access to judgments in some courts a few hours in advance, uh, maybe even a few minutes in advance, so that we can at least read them and understand them. And as Hazel says, we have press officers who will give us summaries and explain things and so on. Um, uh, we need access to the judgment. One of the problems with the Luxembourg court, the CJEU, is that it sometimes gives out a press release and doesn't give you access to the judgment until several hours later, which is absurd, because how are we going to report the judgment if we are told, don't rely on this press release, it's only a summary, read the judgment, and the judgment isn't available, as I was saying yesterday. It seems an extraordinary idea. You know, come back tomorrow. But anyway, leave that to one side. On the web streaming point, um, um, of course, there are practical problems. You couldn't expect web, web streaming of all courts. But we now have web streaming of our Supreme Court in the United Kingdom, um, and anybody can watch. And it can be broadcast, and it was broadcast. And when we had a particularly high-profile case, the Miller case about exi exiting the EU, a lot of that was carried live on television, and I was doing commentary and explanation for Sky News explaining uh, what was going on. Um, and in other courts, one can go along. It's sometimes very strange. I went along to a court just to show uh, a student round, and I sat in the press bench, and the judge, uh, who knows me, I know him, we were, and the press bench is very close to where the judges sit, he was staring at me as if to say, what are you doing in my court? Nobody ever comes into my court. And I couldn't sort of say anything to him except in sign language, you know. I had to say, well, I'm here, you know. Um, and it was, it was fine, and um, it, it, he found it really strange. But it, it, it was a very good thing that I was able to go into court. We journalists now go into family courts. Um, and again, um, that's something that doesn't happen a great deal. And uh, I went into family courts and uh, when the rules were changed and the lawyers said, you know, I, I object to having the press here. And the judge said, no, the press can stay. They're entitled to. So it's very important that we act as a public watchdog. I don't want to go into the kitchen every time I go to a restaurant. But I do want the kitchen to be open to an inspector who may well be me, who can walk into that kitchen at any time and inspect it and make sure it's going uh, properly, because if the kitchen knows that it's available for inspection, it's more likely to be clean. Um, thanks a lot. Now, 
I think we have found the solution to the kitchen and restaurant <laughs> problem. Um, <laughs> Professor Kirchhoff, you, you've made so many notes that I uh, that you shall get uh, the chance, but uh, then I've seen the first. Um, uh, so maybe Professor Kirchhoff and then uh, the guy in this. Just a short remark, uh, we don't like court TV, that would be nonsense. It's only entertainment and it's no interest in what the, just, uh, the jurisprudence will be. Therefore, we don't like it and we are only a little more open for contacts with TV uh, if there is a general interest on a higher level. Why, why don't you and like it? What have, what have you got to hide? Why don't you like uh, te television to broadcast no, your proceedings? No, we have nothing to hide. The, no? the process is a public process. Uh, you wind the public and you can't repeat it if you, the camera is rolling. That's the difference. And you can repeat it. You can show it again and again and again and think, and therefore we are sometimes a little bit defensive about this question. If you have a party or witness, which is not used to uh, TV, if the camera is rolling, uh, say, get a red hat and say, start to stutter, or say, don't appear. We had these cases, and therefore I would say we must be flexible. <laughs> Me, as a justice at the Federal Constitutional Court, I have no problems with TV. But if I ask a person, if we, as we like to say, grill them on the rostrum, then I must... Uh, deliberate, is it good for that what we want to know, or it's only for show? And I will don't do it for show. No, I understand that, and I ought to make it clear, I'm not saying that witnesses should be televised, but I am saying that appellate courts, appeal courts, should be televised. And then you have the problem too with the lawyers, and no, we don't. they want no, no, a we TV don't. show. No, we don't. And that alters the... And not, not, that's not our experience. The mentality in the process, the atmosphere, no. they will change. No. <laughs> well, in fact, I'd like to see the lawyer who would not want to be on television, but, <laughs> but uh, I've got the first sign from the audience. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, William Valasidis, I'm the Director of Communications of the Court of Justice of the European Union, so I would actually have to take issue with what Mr. Rosenberg has said. We do send the judgment upon request immediately. But, but it says the judge, the full judgment is not going to be available till later in the day. It says so on the website because uploading to the website is a complicated process and it's not, it, it doesn't happen immediately. But why not? Why not? But why, why not? Why not, develop, why not put them up at the same time? Why not send them around? I have to go into, into, into details about how it is complicated for the court to manage its own website which is hosted in the commission, etc. Uh, but no, no. Uh, it, takes, it takes some time to upload the, uh, the judgments. Think, when, whenever, whenever a journalist yeah. asks us for the judgment, they get it immediately. I, I'll, give you, I'll give you the answer. Give the judgment the following day, and then you can have uploaded the judgment to the website the previous day, and you can release the judgment on the website at the same time as the press release when the court sits. There were cases where judgment were, were corrected even five minutes before announcement. Well, before then, then give, give the so, judgment a day later. But anyway, it, uh, you said that, uh, that, uh, that we don't give the judgment, which is false. We do. Well, uh, it, it, uh, says on the, it says on the uh, press release, come, uh, come back later, it uh, says. Then uh, there is also another issue. Uh, in order to, to upload the judgment on, on the internet, the parties have to be notified, and we have to know, uh, especially in direct actions, that the parties have been notified first. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I would like to raise, to raise another issue because it was, it, was, uh, it was briefly discussed about whether it should be uh, specialists, so press officers or judges, uh, uh, themselves who should be actually talking to the press about the judgment. And there I would like to share with you my experience, and uh, uh, Advocate General Bobek knows that very well. We are, uh, as communications director, we are handed uh, the, the judgment uh, about uh, uh, two or three weeks before it is, it is actually going to be published, and we have to draft a press release. But just in order to be safe, we always send uh, the, the, the draft press release either to the Advocate General, if it's an opinion, or to the reporting judge. And there, the friction starts because we are trying to make uh, uh, communication easy uh, uh, for the public. We are trying to, to, to make uh, the judgments in such a way as, to, as, as for a journalist to, to be able to understand it. But always the interventions of, of, of the judges or advocates general are to make the, 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 uh, the language more legal. And this is precisely the, the uh, quote unquote battle that we, that we, we actually have to to engage in on a daily basis. Let me give you an example. We had the Google case, 
And of course, the press release mentioned the right to be forgotten, but the, 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 the judgment did not say right to be forgotten. If we had published the press release with right of, to dereferencing, for example, it, we, it would be a lost case. Nobody would understand. So uh, we had to actually explain that if we, if we do not use that term, then the press release is, will be of no use. Thank you very much. I'd like to give the floor now to Professor Resnick and then Professor Gierich. Uh, thank you for this engaged exchange. I wanted to um, ask questions about the power to decide. We're talking, you, the discussion has been about what should or shouldn't be transparent or public, but not actually about where the rules come from in terms of who decides what will or will not be public. And obviously, one is the interpretation of convention or constitutions or common law obligations that are then interpreted by courts. Another would be legislative or regulatory control. Another, of course, is parties who may not agree. The um, expansion of the United States of people either with or without non-disclosure agreements bringing their information to the web to announce is another vehicle. And right now, there's pending federal legislation to prohibit silencing in sexual misconduct cases uh, as a way to control. So I, I would be would love to hear from the different panelists their understanding of who should make the rules about what their own, your different views of what should be public or private or transparent or not is. Uh, if you want the kitchen metaphor, who who is it who is deciding what and what level of information we see? Maybe we can collect those both statements for the final round. Yes, I, I have a question to Vice President Kirchhoff. Why is it the task of the President and the Vice President of the Federal Constitutional Court to explain the decisions of their chambers or senates? They are just one judge uh, uh, of, of a bench of, of, of eight members. Wouldn't it be the, the, the task of the full bench to make that explanation? And what happens if the president or vice president were in the minority? Um, that may get 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 difficult. I I, I see your point, uh, but uh, I find uh, it gives perhaps the president and vice president too much influence on the interpretative authority of the judgments and decisions of their senates or, or chambers. Okay. Um, is there any more urgent request for statements or questions? If not, I'd like to give the floor for the final round. And I'd like to uh, supply one more question for each of you. Um, we have those candles here on the table. Um, just imagine, please, we had Christmas. Um, what would be your most favorite wish um, for open just justice? But first, Professor Kirchhoff, please. This is my Christmas wish. Oh, in which order you ever yeah. want? No, uh, to the last question, uh, it's the competence of the presiding judge to have the contact at the, uh, to the journalists and so on. And therefore, I think we are professionals. I'm able uh, to interpret and to explain uh, judgment uh, which uh, said I have been against. And that happens often. And sometimes as a reporting judge, I'm coming into the deliberation with the opinion A and I go out with the opinion B and have to write it down. That's, uh, that's quite an experience, but be quite sure I can manage it. <laughs> and my Christmas wish. Uh, I, this is a very special one. We are a constitutional court, and in the main cases there is uh, dispute about the constitutional of parliamentary laws. And if you have all hearing, in the main, uh, regularly, there are no members of the parliaments present. And if they are present, they say not a single word. And we discuss their product, the parliamentary law. That would be my Christmas wish, but it's a very German one. Maybe a word to Professor Resnick. Um. I have not uh, understand where your, uh, what your uh, question aims to. What is the source of the authority? Where, who has the power and who ought to have the power to set the parameters 
around what is public and what is not put forth that are we, in the process in the, the process or the outcomes whether we're talking about judicial misconduct proceedings or whether we're talking about other substantive mm -hmm. There, we've lived in a, a world in which we can assume it's public because it's been in court and this is how you've done it for X hundreds of years, but it's all changing. So who, where, maybe on your wish list, how would you structure the authority to figure out the answer to the complicated balances that we've all been discussing? I think if it deals with the process, it's the parliament, the law. But if it uh, comes to contacts to journalists and so on, this sort of uh, contacts and communication, I think it's a mix between uh, the, uh, the situation and the standing of uh, justice made by the law and the all day practice, uh, what it needs, it develops. And therefore, it's a sort of sensibility for situations. In the third part, in the second part, I can give you no clear answer. In the first part, Parliament law. Professor, again, your Christmas wish, and feel free, please, to add everything you want to tell us. Uh, okay, so um, actually, I'll start with Judith's question, and certainly in, in our jurisdiction, and Joshua will correct me if I'm wrong, I think that responsibility or power to decide issues about publicity is rather diffuse. So different people at different times. If you, if you say, who do I think should have responsibility? I agree with you. Then in the first instance, I think parliament, and I think that should be that those kinds of issues should be decided through the democratic process. But I think that also, judge, and I know that judges at the moment have a lot of uh, power to decide how they will relate to um, the press and what goes on in their courts. And I think to a certain extent that should continue. But basic principles about openness, about whether you can televise things or whatever, I think um, actually should be decided by parliament through the democratic process um, uh, because of the, the, the desirability of publicity and transparency. Uh, and there you can debate how you find the balance between too much publicity or not sufficient privacy. Um, on the question of my Christmas wish, I really hadn't been given enough notice of that to think about it. Um, so I'm gonna be extremely parochial uh, and say that I have a serious um, Christmas wish for what's going on in the United Kingdom, or, or, or certainly in England and Wales, in relation to our move from uh, physical courts to online courts and that is that if this is going to happen and it is going to happen that in that process we collect the information so we bake into the software the architecture of the software the ability to collect data that will help us to evaluate what, pro what the processes are and what the outcomes of the new processes are. So if we say this is a procedure that will improve access to justice, we will be in a position at some point down the line to show, to demonstrate that that has indeed been the case or the contrary, that in fact we have excluded people who previously did have access to the cause and that we can also demonstrate that we are delivering uh, just outcomes by fair processes, because uh, that would be that. Because ultimately, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Thanks a lot, Professor Clement. Yeah, um, thank you. Maybe I come back to the little controversial with um, um, Advocate General uh, Bobek um, about. Not, not the kitchen, no, no. Uh, well, I, I, I know a good restaurant and the kitchen is very, it's, it's open. I really have the impression that they cook where they, where they stand. But um, <laughs> I have also other uh, nice, uh, known other nice restaurants and the kitchen is behind closed doors and I trust them because it's good what comes on the plates. Now, I, I don't want to come back to the kitchen, but to uh, the more abstract question um, about the, uh, is, um, is transparency an end in itself or does it have an ins only an instrumental role, uh, instrumental value, as you said? And uh, because I was arguing that it is an end in itself, I would just like to defend me by saying um, to, to, to argue that um, transparency and openness is an end in itself doesn't necessarily mean that it is unlimited. You know, it doesn't have to be an absolute right. But uh, I think we should admit that there is at least a point of people, and 
it's it's just I you know to say it doesn't have to be justified to say I want to know what's going on on the courts, even if uh, uh, there is no uh, good impact on the on the process. So that was my uh, point on on this. Um, the question of uh, P Professor Resnick, I think I I already have answered to this because I said um, I think that the Parliament is the best place to discuss about public. Uh, but of course, it's always a shared process. For example, inter inter interpreting the constitution uh, uh, always um, provides some limits to the political process. I think this is the um, the basic function of law uh, um, in in every respect. Yeah, and then I have my Christmas wish. I don't know why do we have the candles on the table? Is this just a specific reason? Um, okay, um, <laughs> so it wasn't planned by you. <laughs> but maybe but that. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, well, I must say I think that uh, all we discussed here is, in my eyes, a, a bit the mirror of uh, social changes, and uh, uh, so. Um, it's, we're in a quite lucky position that we only discuss uh, the uh, judicial impact of those uh, changes. But if I should really say an honest wish, I, 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 I really hope that our society um, remains an open society and that um, it, it remains fair and fact-based. And uh, so I think if we have that society, we have less problems uh, with the courts. Um, so that's a, a big wish, I know, uh, but maybe we could try and um, uh, work on it. Yeah. Thanks. General Advocate Brubeck. Uh, thank you. I'm still digesting the idea that the courts are the problem. Um, the question which was posed by Professor Resnick, um, um, I suppose, yes, the universal answer will always be sort of on the general level, it's always nice to have the guidance by the parliament or the, by the democratic process. The problem and rather is practical. I mean, it's difficult to discuss it as such a level of abstraction, but for instance, thinking about one subset, access, because you, you, you mentioned disclosure. So I thought you were going in the direction of access to judicial files, access to pleading, access to the file. Okay, if I, I, if I take that subset, I mean, of course, it should be great if legislature would have made up their mind what they want in terms of the overall framework and then leave the details to be fleshed out, certainly in the individual cases of application to the courts to decide themselves. Unfortunately, it rarely works in such an ideal world. And by the way, the already mentioned example of sub Supreme Court of the United Kingdom web streaming some of these hearings, I seriously doubt there is an act of parliament for that, okay? So from this point of view, the legal basis for that, whether it would be parliamentary, big question mark. The only last thing I would like to bring into the equation who should decide here is the parties. And in particular, uh, we have seen it actually in the practice of the Court of Justice in the past, in particular in the field of access to party pleadings and access to the file. Okay? So from the point of view, the, the system not being entirely open for the moment, and then at a certain stage, actually parties disclosing sets of pleadings for various purposes, some of them less legitimate than others. And of course, I mean, the idea there is, well, one doesn't want to dislocate the hearing outside the court, at which stage, whether it's punishable, is it contempt of court, is it correct, and it opens a lot of questions. So I just wanted to insert into this idea who should decide the dichotomy classical parliament courts. Well, they happen to be parties, and they often have very different ideas. Christmas wish. I didn't prepare anything that profound, I'm afraid, but since I recently was able for the first time ever <laughs> no, 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 for, since I was recently uh, able to smuggle for the first time ever into the case of the Court of Justice Star Wars, I, I mean, into an opinion, I thought that in order to provide for the overall balance and equilibrium, I suppose my Christmas wish for openness and, tra and transparency would be simply long live and prosper. Joshua Rosenberg, what is the wish of the public watchdog? Okay, well, the answer to Professor Resnick's question is, is not Parliament, but the courts. The, the courts must have control over their own proceedings. It must be possible for the judge 
to uh, exclude the media in certain circumstances and to prohibit reporting and so on. Our judges are in control of their own proceedings. We don't have a written constitution. Uh, the Advocate General is right. There is no act of parliament that says whether the Supreme Court can televise its proceedings or not. I asked the predecessor, the House of Lords, which was then the final Court of Appeal, for permission to televise a judgment when it gave an important judgment. Uh, and I was granted permission on the basis that there was no restriction. Curiously, um, and this is quite instructive, there is legislation on televising of the courts, but it applies only to England and Wales. It was passed in the 1920s when uh, the press were taking cameras, still cameras, into courts and taking pictures of defendants in criminal trials. And legislation was passed to say that you weren't allowed to take photographs or make sketches in the courts. Uh, this legislation is still in force. It's broken every moment of the day because there are security cameras which take pictures of people going in and out of court. That's unlawful. Nobody minds. Uh, but nevertheless, it's against the law in England and Wales. Um, and uh, the courts in Scotland about 20 years ago thought it would be a good idea for their proceedings to be televised in certain circumstances. And they looked around and they noticed that this legislation did not apply in Scotland. It applied only in England and Wales. So the judges had the power to decide whether their proceedings could be shown. Uh, they said it required the permission of everybody concerned. Uh, and there were proceedings shown, and this was thought to be a very good uh, thing because people in Scotland had very little idea of how their courts operated. They were, had some idea of how the English courts operated. They had a very good idea about how courts operated in the United States, but they had absolutely no idea of how their courts operated, um, and it seemed a good idea. Ultimately, obviously, Parliament in a democracy um, can make or unmake any law. And if the judges go too far in allowing their proceedings to be televised um, or don't go far enough, uh, that can be changed. The law has been changed to allow the possibility of further proceedings to be shown in criminal cases that hasn't yet been brought into effect. Parliament ultimately has to say. But in a court, I think the, the, the decision should be taken by the judge, uh, obviously, after hearing the parties. Uh, my Christmas wish list is for the poor beleaguered press officer of the Court of Justice of the European Union who has to put up with these appallingly difficult judgments and quite difficult Advocate General's opinions, the judgments which are circular, are contradictory, and in the end say the answer to the question is one that I send back to the National Court to ask itself and then decide on the basis of this. And it goes round and round and round every five years. So you are faced with impossible, incomprehensible, self-contradictory judgments, utterly confusing, garbled Advocate General's opinions written in, in languages and translated into other languages uh, and then translated again and then incomprehensible in any language. And you are then being asked to provide a summary of that and you're told the only words you can use are the words that make no sense in the original opinion or the judgment. So I sympathize with you. My Christmas present to you would be a court which allows you to explain what the court actually meant in the first place. Okay, I'd like to thank very much the lady and the gentleman here at this round table, which in fact are two round tables. And now I think Professor Hess would have the very final words. Thank you very much. I will be very brief now because we are late. But uh, let me say two words. We are at the end of a conference about open justice. This is a metaphor. This is not a fixed term, and we made it deliberately. We wanted to see where we are standing today and where we are going to. And we started from a clear concept, which is a well, legal concept, better, not a clear one, a legal concept, public hearing. And then we confronted it with social reality. Juliet Resnick made it this morning. Yeah? It's fantastic to see all these court buildings, but the question is, how many cases go to those places? And the next step was to reflect about technical changes and changes in the society. 
And here again, we have to see, and it was made very clear yesterday, the IT revolution has already arrived. Our question is, where is a place of the court in this virtual world? We cannot simply deny it because we don't like it. So this is something which was made also very clear. And at the same time, societal change might imply that courts have to communicate differently. And I was very much pleased that the press release issue came up today. It's not longer the tree angle. We have to think in the square. And we have to look at the public. And we have also to look at the role of the public um, and the expectations of the society with regard to the courts. We did not use the word transparency. And this was a deliberate choice, frankly spoken. Uh, transparency is also a metaphor, and open justice is certainly not better. But um, finally, what is the aim, not of transparency, but of the justice system? This is the main question here. What is a justice system about? And it is about just and fair outcomes, judgments, <coughs> settlements, etc. And for these just and fair outcomes, we do need procedures which implement values, rule of law, procedural fairness, quality of the parties, etc., etc. Don't forget, this was the objective the conference was about. And we have to fight for a situ situation where we still can guarantee courts which are able to attract cases and render judgments which are just and fair. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of a conference which I liked a lot. I have to thank all the speakers, all the panelists, uh, the audience, and also the collaborators of the Institute for their help. And I can only wish you a safe trip home. And I hope to see you again here at the Max Planck Institute in a close future. Bye-bye.